good to be it's good to be in the house of God thank you so much uh, praise team give God praise for the praise team please everybody great job um, I'd like uh, just Tabitha and Tapang please come here please come you can hey amen just stand here stand here facing me stand here facing me in the front um, the Lord instructed me to pray for you um, there's going to be two significant doors are going to open for your life this year one of them is going to look like a blessing but it's the enemy trying to trap you and one of them is going to look like small and insignificant but it's going to open up things which are going to blow your mind so in this season I want you to know that God is with you he sees all your hard work he sees all the moves you're making but this is the year where something big and life-changing is going to come to your life let's just stretch our hands father God we thank you for these gifts we pray Heavenly Father bless them bless the work of their hands bless their efforts bless their hard work father we pray Heavenly Father for the release of blessing increase favor we thank you father for the door that's about to open father may they walk through it with wisdom and love in the name of jesus amen amen, amen. give god praise amen amen, amen. um another thing is i want to just to bring up before i even get into this work is um the lord is telling me to invite you all into a fantastic opportunity um there's a church um, in Pretoria having in the middle of a building program they found a building which they want to buy and they're raising money uh, called Muso Church and um, I want us at the end of the month as a church to take up an offering um, to assist them and to help them in their push it's so important that we be a church that helps other churches um, there's a blessing in that and not only that we also have to break the mentality of doing everything motivated for blessings but to do things because we we just want to honor God and help other people achieve what God has called them to do amen so um, administrators just take note that at the end of this month we're going to take um, a special offering uh, for Musa Church and I want everybody to pray about it let God show you what to give you know let God inspire you to give and uh, we're going to give we're definitely going to assist them and help them um, they are targeting to raise 7 million rand in 30 days so you know whatever way we can help we can help you know I was uh, I was talking to the offering I was giving uh, my offering and it started off the lord just told i couldn't say the amount i kept saying two million two hundred thousand i was like hey this figures <laughs> where are they coming from but there's a time coming where we will give two hundred thousand we'll give two million like it's nothing because our god is a generous god he's a blessing god and he is able amen so just please pray about it just go on their site as well and just look at the wonderful work that they're doing they released a one of the best worship albums um, this country has ever seen uh, last year Jesus to the city volume 2 I'd encourage you to get it um, we are really blessed in South Africa with musical talent and we have to just keep praying that God blesses the worshipers in this country that we also have something to say we thank God for Hillsong um, they are definitely the gold standard in terms of impacting the world with worship and then of course there's the other two um, Bethel and Elevation um, those are the those are the big three um, and we are praying that let Africa develop its own big three you know churches that write songs for the whole world amen um, and I think Musa very definitely in that um, in that class right now um, and uh, look at your neighbor and say we're coming to are we coming to amen 
we've got something to say. We've got songs. We've got, we've got tents. Hey. Hallelujah. We should sing tents again after this. Amen. Um, so thank you so much. And then I also want to acknowledge my incredible wife. She had a rough couple of weeks with our son who was sick. She missed Easter. She was in um, the hospital. And so it was just a, it was a very rough. Uh, it was a crucifixion for us this uh, Easter. But uh, she managed to handle it um, with a plum. So we thank you for that. Um, and we also want to remember Pastor Cindy in your prayers. She's not feeling well. Please um, remember in your prayers. Amen. Um, this month we are looking at the book of Corinth. As a church, we preach through books. And um, we don't really invent messages. We just preach what the Bible is saying. Um, so in the book of Corinth this month and next month, for those who, are, who like reading ahead, we're going to be in the book of Jeremiah. The writer of the book of Corinth is the Apostle Paul. He wrote it in AD 55 from Ephesus on his third missionary journey. It, Paul had three missionary journeys that are in the book of Acts, for those who've read the book of Acts. In his second missionary journey, he spent 18 months in the city of Corinth. So his first missionary journey, the area where he spent most of his time was Galatia. That's why there's a book of Galatians. Second missionary journey, Corinth. And then third missionary journey, he spent two years um, in Ephesus, uh, preaching and teaching every day. I wish I was there. Um, so he's in Ephesus right now, writing to Corinth, where he was on his second missionary journey. And the, message, uh, and, uh, the main message that he's um, teaching them is to encourage unity, because there's division in that church, holiness, and spiritual maturity and this is all done by being uh, centered around the gospel and one of the interesting things about the church in Corinth is in other churches is dealing with false teachers but in this particular city I believe that Paul is combating false culture he's dealing with negative culture and its impact um, on Christians and the way this book is structured is chapters 1 to 6 he's responding to a letter from a lady named Chloe she came uh, with the report in Ephesus that there's trouble at this church and there's various things she reported to him and he begins to deal with them so the first thing he addresses is division the next thing he addresses is sexual sin then he addresses legal disputes among believers and then from chapter 7 to 16, Paul addresses uh, specific questions that have risen from the church in Corinth. And uh, he begins to respond to inquiries regarding marriage, inquiries regarding celibacy, uh, food sacrifice to idols, Christian liberty, spiritual gifts, the Lord's Supper. There were certain people who were turning the Lord's Supper into a drinking session. They would come and get drunk on the wine and they were desecrating the Lord's Supper. So he deals with that. And um, he deals with the issue of resurrection, which we dealt with last week. And we're going to deal with it again. There's another half of that um, text. And then he's also dealing with a collection for saints. Uh, there's an offering they were raising up for people in Jerusalem. Um, so turn with me to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. And uh, we're going to go to verse 18. And I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. Where it says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. 
for Jews request a sign. Sounds like Africans. Greeks seek after wisdom. Sounds like the Western world. But we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block. And to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than man. And the weakness of God stronger than man. Our powerful Father, who is ever wise, ever gracious, ever generous, we come into your presence this morning. Father, even as we come back to the cross, Father, back to the mystery, help us, Heavenly Father, to see your power and your wisdom. Transform our lives, transform our families, transform the attitudes of our hearts, transform our worship through the preaching of the word. Intensify our adoration of who you are. Intensify our trust and our faith, even as we build our families, as we figure out the complexities of our lives and everything we're trying to achieve. Father, may we trust in you more than ever. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you so much. My Bible talk today is omniscience, the omniscience of God. Number one, the omniscience of God is his perfect knowledge of all things. His perfect knowledge, perfect, infinitely perfect knowledge of all things. Number two, God knows himself perfectly and completely. As man... We know God imperfectly and incompletely. In fact, we don't even know ourselves perfectly and we don't even know ourselves completely. And God is so big that even in heaven, we're not going to know Him perfectly and completely. Number three, God's omniscience extends to Him seeing and hearing everything in His creation. Nothing can be hidden from him. So when he judges us all at the end of the age, all the evidence shall be before him. God cannot be deceived. Number four, God's omniscience extends to perfectly and continually knowing all created beings, past, present, and future. Their conversations, their thoughts, their actions, their desires, their plans, their strategies, their secrets, their prayers, their promises. God knows everything about every created being in his creation. Every prophetic word, it's all before him right now. There is nothing that Satan is thinking that God can see. There is nothing he's planning. That God can see. There is no secret. There is no secret. There is no way where Satan can hide from God. God's omniscience is one thing the devil wishes didn't exist. Because when he thought in his heart he could rebel against God, as soon as the thought entered, God had already detected, before even the thought entered, oh my goodness, God then expelled him immediately. Number five, God's omniscience extends to knowing all forms of knowledge, studies, technologies, sciences, both known and unknown. They are technologies which God knows in his mind, which we don't even know yet. Hallelujah. Some of you need to pray to God for technology. Hallelujah. You're yeah, always praying for anointing. Always praying for deliverance. Say, Father, show me a technology that is not in this world. Always praying for husbands. Some of you ladies, pray for technology. You need to start companies. Are you hearing me? You need to start businesses. A technology company. Number eight. God's omniscience is an incommunicable attribute. In other words, there is no created being who can ever share in it. No created being in heaven and earth will ever be omniscient. So even when we die, go to heaven, we will not be omniscient. 
God will still be a mystery. We'll still be discovering things about God in heaven. Like, oh, oh. There'll be other omni things we'll be learning. He's omnisplendiferous. Are you hearing me here? Number nine. I love this one, and I felt my brother Travis Green here. God's omniscience means that nothing takes him by surprise. Nothing takes him by surprise. He's got it figured out. He's got it all figured out. Nothing. We are worried about elections. Nothing in that election is going to take God by surprise. He knows the hearts and minds of every South African. He knows where the mood is. Hallelujah. He knows where the vote is going right now. So he's not, he's not, he's not nervous. So even when he looks at your life, he's got it all figured out. Whatever he has planned cannot be transformed or diminished by an election. He's got it all figured out. So don't worry. Number 10. God's omniscience is one of the things which makes God not need faith. God doesn't have faith. He knows all things, sees all things. Therefore, he can't be hindered by anything. He doesn't need faith. God doesn't need faith. What for? He's omniscient. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. He sees everything. He sees everything. He sees ways where there seems to be no way. Because he can see ways. He can see ways which you can't see. Are you hearing me here? Ah, my limited, my limitation made me skip some points here. The real number six. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for reminding me I'm just a man. God's omniscience extends to knowing events and possibilities and outcomes based on the decisions and actions of every living thing every day. So God is seeing everyone's decision. How many billion? Eight billion decisions being made. God is aware of them. And his purpose is cutting through every... There is no free will that can hinder him. Whatever he has willed, it's cutting through every decision. There's no decision we are making that can hinder what God wants to do right now. Are you hearing me here? The real number seven. God's omniscience is not passive. It's active. He doesn't just do things and sit on a mountain and say, I know everything. His omniscience is actually active. And it's active in providence. Are you hearing me here? He, providence means he's governing all things and bringing them to his expected end. He's governing all things, even traffic. Even the weather today, somewhere in his omniscience, it had to be cold. And you had to wear that jacket which makes you feel thin. Somewhere in his omniscience, there is a plan that is being executed just in that jacket. Once upon a time, my wife was having a birthday. And I wore this jacket which she hated. And all the way she was... When I arrived, she was complaining, Why did you wear this jacket? You're going to embarrass me to my friends. Little did she know, in that jacket was an engagement ring. Are you hearing me here? And it was a very nice jacket. It's just that my wife doesn't know fashion. <laughs> a very nice jacket from Oriental Plaza. And in there, there was an engagement ring. Are you hearing me here? God, in his omniscience, she could have offended me where I say, ah, ah, I'm going to marry this crazy woman. <laughs> but God, in his omniscience, sometimes in difficult, ugly things, are beautiful things that he has in store for your life. Are you hearing me here? His omniscience is not passive. It's his governing and, you know, you don't know why your child is in a hospital for a week, but he's providentially, there's something he's working you can't see it. You can't, you can't see it while you're going through it. Because all things are working together for good. 
He sees everything and he knows what he is doing. Nothing catches God by surprise. He's got your life figured out. I've come to tell someone, stop worrying. Stop being anxious. Anxiety has never changed anything. Worry never fixes anything. Trust God. Pray. Seek Him. Stop being worried about it. He's got it figured out. And He's in control. Amen. Give God praise right there. So as we begin our journey in 1 Corinthians, um, it's an interesting letter that's driven by Paul dealing with problems in a church. He's responding to problems in the church. And um, I was talking to Andrew about it. It's different from Romans. Romans is very high-level theology. Because he had never been to Rome, he, he doesn't know the problems of Rome. So he keeps it on a very high theo- theological concept of the gospel. He doesn't get entangled in the problems um, in Rome. But in Corinth, because he's been in this church, he started this church, and has received a report of problems, he's now dealing with problems in that church. And our pericope, if you've noticed, starts in verse 18. But in verses 1 to 3, if you look at verses 1 to 3, it's known as Paul's um, greetings um, to the church in Corinth. And thank you very much. Hallelujah. One, two, one, two. So in verses one to three, Paul greets the church in Corinth. And there's, a, there's like a greeting formula which he uses um, in all of his letters and in all of his epistles. And it's an interesting piece because before... Okay, can you do something like that? My armor bearer. <laughs> So Paul greets this church in Corinth and mentions that he's with a man called Sosthenes, Sosthenes, as he's writing. And when he gets to verses 4 to 5, he begins to offer a prayer of thanksgiving. And if you notice, Paul, Paul's letters always have that formula. He starts off with a greeting, San Bonani, and then he moves to prayer. Amen. Whenever he visits someone, start with a greeting and then just say, let's pray. Are you hearing me here? Bless them. And then from verse 10 to 17, um, we enter the body of the letter where he begins to mention a major issue in the church in Corinth, which many churches today struggle with, which is division. And um, so concerning division, he tells them, I need you to speak one language and be united. And in ministry... We have to be, in ministry and as a church, we have to be very careful not to allow division among us. Yes. We must always know that we are one body. Yes. We are one church and one family. Yes. Our city, Johannesburg, is very materialistic, equally. We are built on foundations of uh, financial aspiration and the pursuit of money. And uh, we have a very demanding marketplace. Every person in this, pl- in this building, no matter what job they have, they can tell you it's very demanding. Yeah. From the waiter to the janitor to the bank teller to the accountant, there's no, there's no easy job in Joburg. Yeah, Every job is demanding. Amen. You know, um, Prudence is a teacher. I don't know how many children. Two are already demanding for me. <laughs> I don't know how you manage. But every job is demanding. Amen. And uh, not only that, we're under the, the shadow of crime. And, and, and so, so what the, the forces in our city create, they create us being individualistic and keeping to ourselves. Even how our complexes are designed. There's gates, there's walls, there's cameras. We are, our city is designed to isolate you. Yeah. Our city is designed to make you individualistic. So church is a place designed to break individualism and self-centered tendencies that are rife in Johannesburg. And they're designed to bring you into the freedom that is found in being in a community of believers. And one of the major drivers of anxiety and depression in this city, Johannesburg, is individualism. Because there is a freedom of the soul that comes from not just living for yourself, but living for others. 
living to serve, living to love, and living to befriend other believers who love God and His gospel just like you. So in a church, it's important that you must resist keeping to yourself. You have to resist keeping to yourself in church. Don't be that person who, I just come and I'm out. Yeah. Resist that. Resist withdrawing. You know, there's always that tendency in churches where you start to withdraw yourself. Resist spectating. Yeah. Resist coming to church and just being a spectator. Yeah. Resist making church attendance optional. I used to laugh with Pastor Lungi when the weather is like this, we'd phone each other and say, get ready, winter is coming. Because for some people, when it's cold, they don't come to church. Because church is optional. Are you hearing me here? Resist being in a clique. In church, make sure that you just don't only talk to the same people. Step out of your, 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 the usual people you talk to and talk to more people. Be intentional about talking to people who you don't talk to every Sunday. Amen. And then also resist bringing division in church. By speaking bad of your pastors, of your leaders, or other members of the church itself. Or speaking bad of the church itself. Resist being also easily offended. There's some people in church easily offended. Be slow to anger. Quick to forgive one another. And above all in church, love one another. We are a church. And God, by his providence, has brought us together. We need to love each other. We need to pray for one another. Because the power of church is this. Church is one place where people who would not ordinarily be together come together. You can have on the same team someone who is a doctor, someone who is a CEO, someone who is unemployed, someone who has a hundred degrees, someone who's uneducated, but working together, loving each other, it's unto the Lord. That's the beauty of church. It's a place where everybody is welcome and everybody is able to equally love God and love one another. Where it doesn't matter where you, what boardroom you are in, but you can be in a church with someone who drives a taxi and you can hold hands and pray for the country and something changes. That's the power of church. We come together to love one another. We need each other. And we need to believe together to see God doing amazing things beyond what we can imagine. But that comes from unity. Psalm 133 one says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. Let's resist the sin of division in the church when it raises its ugly head in our hearts. Where are you when it comes to unity in this church? Where is your heart? Are you withdrawing or are you drawing closer? Are you secretly offended by something or someone in this church? Let it go. Prophetess Elsa from Frozen Ministries International was right. Let it go. Draw closer to your brothers and sisters in this church. Draw closer. Step out of any offense that damages the church. Where are you in terms of the words you use about the church? Do you speak bad about your pastors? Do you easily complain about everything in church? That doesn't build the church. Get into the freedom of communicating with love and grace with your pastors, leaders, and fellow church members. Resist bringing division in the house. Lean into the freedom of love and unity, serving one another, giving and drawing closer. There's no greater freedom like the community of church working together in unity. Amen. 
Hallelujah. Give God praise right there. And that's what Paul was dealing with in that section. Unity. There was a necessary division. I am of Apollos. I am of Paul. And Paul is like, no, we are of Christ. We gather here around Christ. We gather here around the gospel. We lay down our issues for the sake of the gospel. We lay down our pride for the sake of the gospel. We lay down our offense for the sake of the gospel. We lay down our lofty titles. We park our big cars down there. And we all walk on the same two feet. And we stand in unity before God, the omniscient one who sees all things. And he can see all of our hearts. And he can see who is real and who is not. So our pericope then is um, section 1, is verses 18 to 19. The cross is power disguised as foolishness. And then section 2, verses 20 to 25, the foolishness of the cross orchestrated by God. So let's go to section 1, verses 18 to 19, when Paul says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And this is the thesis statement of what is coming from verses 20 to 25, what he's going to expound. Paul is going to be expositing this truth that the message of the cross is foolishness to who? To those who are perishing. But the same thing that is considered foolishness by those who are perishing is considered the power of God to who? To us who are being saved. So right here, Paul is showing us an important truth about the reality of the world we live in today. In the eyes of God, God doesn't see black, white, Zulu, Nigerian, American, Chinese, when he looks at the earth. Paul divides the world into the two groups that God sees. Those who are perishing and those who are being saved. Those who are perishing. There's white people perishing. There's black people perishing. There's Chinese people perishing. God doesn't say because you're white, you're coming to heaven. You are perishing. And then there's blacks who are being saved. There's whites who are being saved. There's Chinese being saved. And this is known as the doctrine of two paths. That comes from Old Testament uh, poetic literature like Proverbs, Psalms, you see it in Ecclesiastes, which posits that life on earth, there's two people, two types of people walking on the planet today. Uh, there's people walking on the path of wisdom and righteousness or on the path of foolishness and sin. The path of righteousness then, you've got to view it as an escalator that's going up into the glory of God. And the path of sin is an escalator going down into the wrath of God. And it's a very big escalator with a lot of space. Wide is the path which leads to destruction. There are many people on that escalator right now in this shopping mall, not in church, on the escalator going down. And this is extremely striking because um, these two groups see the same thing and respond to it differently. They see the message of the cross and one sees it and says, this is rubbish. And the other sees the cross and sees, this is the greatest treasure that I have found. The perishing see the cross as foolish. But for us who are being saved, we see it for what it really is. It is the very power of God. The perishing see the message of the cross as useless. But for us who are being saved, we see the cross as the most valuable treasure in the universe. So in verse 19, Paul then gives a scriptural basis for what he has said in verse 18. When he says, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Whenever you see it is written in the New Testament, you've got to ask yourself, where was it written? Because they, whenever they say it is written, there's actually an Old Testament scripture. All the times that uh, Jesus uh, responded to Satan in the temptation, it is written, men shall not live by bread alone. He was quoting the book of Deuteronomy. He was quoting the book of Deuteronomy. So where is it written? 
Well, you quickly find out that um, it was written in Isaiah 29:14, and if you understand the structure of Isaiah 20 of Isaiah. Um, in this section, which is chapters 28 to 35, it's a section in that book called the woes section, the woes against Israel, where Isaiah is warning them about judgment that is coming against them. And uh, in, 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 verse, in chapter 29, it's a woe judgment against Jerusalem, in that in the wisdom of man in Israel, there was no way that God would allow Jerusalem to fall, to be destroyed, in order to reveal his power. So he was warning them, uh, God is about to destroy your wisdom and bring to nothing your understanding. Because according to their wisdom, there's no way that God can destroy Jerusalem. The tabernacle is here. The promises of Abraham are here. There's no way God can allow Jerusalem to fall. Are you hearing me here? Oh my goodness. They had put God's power in the box of the Exodus. That God only delivers by a spectacular display of strength, not by a display of weakness, like what happened to Jesus on the cross. On that cruel cross, they couldn't understand it. And right here we begin to see the clash between God's wisdom and the wisdom of man as it relates to the cross. The idea of Jesus on the cross was designed by God to humble man who in his fallen nature has a tendency of thinking that he is wiser than God and can create a better world than God and can govern creation better than God and can disobey God and still succeed. And you've got people in the world today who say, why did God create the devil? Or why did God create the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil? Or allow Adam to fall into sin? And there's even someone who said, uh, why did God kill his son? Why didn't he for our sins? Why didn't he not kill the devil for our sins? Fallen men in our finite capacity always have the tendency of putting God in our limited human categories that are infinitely beneath God and daring to say, I could have done a better job at this creation and governing the world. And to all those who walk on this dangerous path, of questioning the wisdom and omniscience of God. David told us, He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Psalm 2 verse 4. And he shall say to fallen man who is deluded in his fallenness and thinks they can do a better job at being God than God. The same thing he said to Job in 38 verse 4. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me. If you have understanding, who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched out the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Gravity. Who put that gravity in place? Or what laid its cornerstone? Who put it on the right degree of access relative to the sun? Who, who put the sun in its place? The stars. Who decided that all these quantum mechanics are going to work in a certain way that make this planet viable for life? Who decided that? Where were you when I did that? Are you hearing me here? And when we begin to question the wisdom of God, it always reveals our fallenness and our lack of knowledge of the omniscience of God. Pink said, omniscient. the omniscience of God means that God knows everything, everything possible everything actual, all creatures past and present and future, and the future itself. How does God know the future? Because in his omniscience and his omnipotent, he makes it what he wants it to be. No one can frustrate what God wants the future to be. No one can stop it. No one can stop it. God has perfect knowledge of all things known and unknown and could potentially be known. The intelligence of the mind of God is infinitely beyond any creature in heaven or earth. He is aware of every detail in heaven, every detail in the earth, every detail in the universe, every star, every planet, every solar system, every galaxy. He is aware of every detail. In the ocean, every creature, every bird, every 
insect, every atom. There's not an atom on this planet that is not aware of. There's not a cell in your body is not aware. He says, I know, I've even counted the numbers of hairs on your head. There's nothing happening in the earth he can't see, can't hear, can't quantify, can't calculate, and can't strategically deal with. God is never overwhelmed by man's ideas. He's never overwhelmed by Satan's schemes. He gets shocked when you're spending hours praying against the devil. He gets very shocked. He's like, these guys, don't they know that we're not in the same league? God cannot be frustrated or hindered by anything or anyone outside of him. Whatever God wills to happen cannot be stopped. His omniscience means there isn't a problem he cannot solve. There isn't an obstacle he, that can stop him. You yourself can't stop him. You're not powerful enough to stop whatever God wants to do in your life. Even your imperfect faith, your imperfect prayers, your imperfect holiness, your imperfect wisdom, your imperfect effort, what God has set for your life, he will bring to pass. He will bring to pass. You can't stop God. You are just a man. He is God. And what he desires for your life, he will bring to pass. If he has to drag you out of the desert. Moses didn't want to go there. But while Moses was doing his own thing there, he said, I sent Aaron months ago. He's almost at your house. Before you even thought of me calling you, I even saw all your excuses. I sent Aaron. He's been working for three months. Are you hearing me here? He knew, I knew you'd have this silly excuse. I'm sending a spokesman. And for the first plagues, Moses said nothing. He was just standing there. Aaron was doing all the talking. God will even send an Aaron to talk for you. Because this, when he has set for your life, he will send divine help to push you into what he has called you to do. With or without your cooperation, God is about to bless you with or without your cooperation. He's going to make a way for you even though you're feeling weak, you're feeling tired, you're feeling at the end of yourself, you're feeling like there's no way out. God who is omniscient is making ways, he's even using your discouragement to push you into your purpose so whatever you're facing in life know that god has a solution all the odds can be stacked up against you but omniscience can see a way out of it are you hearing me here ah there's nothing that can hinder god let's go to section 2 verses 20 to 25 the foolishness of the cross orchestrated by god so let's go into the meat of this message as we close just now, which is verses 20 to 25, where Paul starts by calling out to the people who are perishing in Corinth, who see the cross as foolishness. And he says, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? There's always people trying to question God. Yeah. Has not God made foolish the wisdom in this world? And how has God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Verse 21 gives us the theological answer. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. So Paul here lets us know very clearly that when he says, the world through its wisdom did not know God, that fallen man in his natural fallen carnal mind cannot come to saving knowledge of God unless God reveals himself. God has to reveal himself to man through the power of the Holy Spirit. You don't come into salvation through intelligence. You, 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 don't, calculate the, you, you don't calculate and try and figure out how, to, how the cross works. God has to reveal it to you. Human intellect and human intelligence alone can seek God all at once. But it will never find God unless God intervenes and reveals himself. Amen. It's by his divine initiative that he reveals himself to men through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Because salvation is not intellectual. 
It's not an intellectual debate. It's a spiritual war. And our duty then is to present the message of the cross and pray and trust that it's the power of the Holy Spirit that's going to regenerate the hearts of stone of men, of the unsaved who are perishing, and make them shift from seeing the cross as foolishness and start to see it as the power of God. So when Paul goes on to say in 21b, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe, he is putting God in his rightful place when it comes to redemption and the salvation of man. He is on the throne sovereign in his power to save. Because sometimes we panic, the world is getting evil, what's going to happen? God doesn't sweat. I've seen all these things already. I saw the transgender agenda years ago. I saw all these poverty schemes. I saw the corruption of African leaders. I've seen all these things, all these schemes, I've seen them. The witchcraft, I've seen it. Every marine spirit, all those things, I've seen them. I'm not moved. Because I am God. As people in church, we have to be careful not to take credit when people get saved. And say it's because of our church program. 100 people got saved. It's because we were dancing, 100 people got saved. People don't get saved because of man. People always get saved because of God. We are the means God uses. But the saving power is not in our hands. We don't have the power to save anybody. We only have the power to proclaim the gospel. But if the Holy Spirit doesn't intervene in that moment, all everything we are doing won't change anybody. It is God who uses us to save people. And we must understand we are just instruments. But He is the musician. The piano can never take credit for a song. Without the musician, it's just a piano. Oh my goodness. We are just instruments in salvation. We are not the causes of salvation. We are the means that please God. The foolishness of a preacher to step up and preach the cross is what pulled you out as a 12-year-old and pulled you into the truth. You don't even remember what he said. You don't even remember if he was preaching the right text. But the Holy Spirit pulls you out of darkness. Takes you from the escalator that's going to hell with those who are perishing. And by the power of God transforms you into somebody who is being saved. Thank God for your salvation. Thank God for the day that he touched your heart. You weren't saved by the fanciness of their speech. The cross came alive in that moment. And the power of God moved you from being spiritually dead. And now you are alive to God. Oh my goodness. Then in verse 22, Paul introduces how culturally those who are perishing view the cross as foolishness. When he says, for the Jews request a sign. And the Greeks seek after wisdom. The Jews in the original audience wanted a Messiah who delivers by spectacular displays of power. They wanted another Moses. They wanted the, they wanted the familiar. They had put God in the box of an old move. And we're always in trouble when we put God in the box of old moves. Bless me the way you blessed them. You see how he did it for your neighbor. And you say, do it for me the way you did it for them. God has a unique way that is going to use you. God has a unique way that is going to bless you. God has a unique way for your life, for your family, for your business, for your path. Don't look at somebody else's story and start being filled with envy. Thank God for what he's doing to your neighbor. But he has a way that is unique. That is going to bring out his glory in a way that doesn't make sense. They wanted Jesus to come and defeat their Roman oppressors. But instead it pleased God in his wisdom to not deliver them through spectacular signs like Moses. But through a lowly humble death 
on a cruel cross. They wanted Jesus to deliver them through powerful signs, wonders, unleashed against their enemies. But Jesus came and surrendered himself to their enemies and got killed by their enemies. The Jews, in their fallen human wisdom, wanted God to deliver them through violent power. But in his wisdom, God chose to deliver them through a display of weakness. Are you hearing me here? Even today, we have believers who come to God seeking a powerful sign. To build their faith and love for God. Do something big for me. Do a miracle for me. Open blind. I will not believe till I see the power of God. Yet God has provided Jesus on the cross as the ultimate sign you should build your faith on. Whenever you go through difficulties, whenever you go through challenges, and you feel like, God, show me a sign, Lord. Things are hard. Show me a sign that you are with me through what I'm going through. He will say, just look at the cross. Look at the sacrifice I made for you. Look at the price that was paid to redeem you. Look at Jesus hanging on that wicked tree as your substitute, absorbing the worst thing you could ever face. So that today for a believer, through Jesus Christ, we are now in a place where the worst thing we could ever face, which is death, is the best thing we're ever going to face. Through Christ. The worst thing we could ever go through is death. But through Christ, it's the best thing because to die is gain because of Jesus Christ. So even the devil knows that if I throw the worst thing at them, I'm actually promoting them. Are you hearing me here? Hallelujah. Through Christ, he's absorbed the worst thing we could ever face. Look at him, the one who is trustworthy. And trust me to see you through this little thing that you are going through. That's why the writer said, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. Hebrews 10, 23. The cross is a testimony of the faithfulness of God. And we can trust him no matter what we go through. He is faithful that promised. He is faithful. Whatever it is you're trusting God for, he's faithful. Hold on by faith. Keep pressing forward. Don't be discouraged. Keep going because he who promised is faithful. You've got a faithful God and you don't need a spectacular sign. Just look at the cross. Look at the cross. Trust the crucified one. He went through that for you. He will bring you out. You're coming out of that desert. You're coming out of that desert season. You're coming out of that valley. You're coming out of that difficult place. You're coming out of that depression. There's a season of joy. There's a season of healing. There's a season of freedom. You're coming out of that anxiety. You're coming out of that psychological trauma. You're coming out of that pain. He'll take the pain away. He'll bring joy. You shall be dancing. You shall be praising. You shall be rejoicing. He is a good God. He is faithful. Oh my goodness. Then he says the Greeks seek after wisdom. Because in, in Corinth there were Greeks. They were near Athens. They were driven by the pursuit of philosophical ideas. Sophia. So in their view our human wisdom is what will save us. And this is a picture of believers who come to God just seeking good advice. For human development. Yet God shows them that the cross, which is not good advice, but the cross is good news. The cross is not good advice telling you what you need to do. The cross is good news telling you what God has done for you through Jesus Christ. To deal with the greatest problem of the human condition, which is sin. Simply because in the wisdom of God, personal development begins with a heart that is transformed through the message of the cross and regenerated by His Holy Spirit from being a heart that is spiritually dead to God. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of sin is broken and you come alive. Ah, 
under the power of grace to God. You, you know, salvation, you, on the day you got saved, you came alive. You were spiritually dead, but now you are alive. You're alive to his presence. You're alive to his goodness. You're alive to his faithfulness. Don't allow sin to kill your worship for God. And then he says, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block, to the Greeks foolishness. To the Jews, Jesus on the cross was a stumbling block because they anticipated a Messiah who would deliver them through a display of power. And the idea that their Messiah would deliver them by being crucified on a cross was really outrageous to them. Because to them, anyone who hangs on a tree is cursed. Deuteronomy 21, 23. Jesus on the cross to them was the ultimate sign that he was rejected and a fake Messiah. Because the fact that he's on a tree, he's under the curse. How can you tell us that our Messiah is a cursed Messiah? How can the one under the curse of God deliver us? It's like a poor person coming to tell you, I've come to teach you how to be rich. To them, there is no way. How, how can this Messiah on the cross be a sign? The, him on the cross is a sign that God rejected him and he was cursed. And then to the Greeks, the Greeks, the ideas of gods were from people like Zeus, Hera, Poseidon, Apollo. Their view of gods were they were always powerful beings. So to tell them that a God came to earth and got crucified by human beings sounded like a big joke. He said to the Greeks, the, the foolishness of the cross was not merely a lack of wisdom, but it was actually insanity. It was madness. To say a God is crucified, ah, you're not mad. You're crazy to believe in a God who was crucified. They would go and listen to these sermons to laugh. Let's go listen to this guy talk about a crucified God. Because that was a humiliating death. The idea of a God willingly undergoing the humiliation of crucifixion was incomprehensible to them. It divided their, their human understanding of what divine power and majesty look like. How could a God who was worshipped as omnipotent and omniscient and glorious lower themselves to the level of humanity and endure the shame of being stripped naked? Crucifixion, ladies and gentlemen, there was... In our pictures, there's always a cloth. In reality, there's never a cloth. You are stripped naked, beaten mercilessly, then hung on this ruthless tree to die like a dog in the streets. It was extremely humiliating. So for them, a crucified God who dies naked on a tree, that's madness. Even today, there is no religion where the selling point is their God being humiliated for his people. There's no religion in the world where their God takes on human flesh and bears their sins. You must bear your sin in every religion. It's your job to bear your sin and to atone for your sin. But in the gospel, we have one who came and said, bring on those sins. I'm willing to be humiliated. I'm willing to die naked on the tree for you. Then in verse 20 to 5, 24 to 25, Paul says this about Christ being crucified to us who are not perishing. He says, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, is the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than any man. The cross is the place where the wisdom of God and the power of God were displayed in a very unique way. All through the Bible, we've seen the power of God in display, particularly in the Old Testament. And the greatest display of God's power is in Genesis 1, when God created the earth and the heavens from nothing. What a powerful God steps into nothing and creates everything. There is no human being who can do that. If you can do that, you are now a God. No one can create from nothing. You can do affirmations till your nose falls off. You don't have that power. Only God has that power. It's the greatest display of power in the Old Testament. How God created everything from nothing. But on the cross we see the power of God in a unique way. In how he defeated sin and death 
through suffering on the cross. In verse 25, he tells us why God chose the cross, a place of weakness and pain and humiliation, as a place to demonstrate his power. It's because the foolishness of God is wiser than man. And the weakness of God is stronger than man. God is so wise that even our highest level of thinking cannot come close to his lowest level of thinking. God is so powerful that even our highest level of man's power does not come close. Satan's highest level of power doesn't come close. So when Paul says the foolishness of God is greater than man's wisdom, it's a statement to humble us. That when we think that God has made a foolish decision, we need to repent. When we think we could have done things better, we must know firstly God cannot be foolish. And even if God was to be foolish, his foolishness would still be greater than any level of wisdom you could ever come up with. That's why you must trust him with your life. That's why you must trust him with your life. It's not making sense to me, but it's making sense to God. God is so immutably powerful, he cannot be weak. God is so immutably powerful, he cannot even get better. God cannot grow or improve. He is infinite perfection immutably. There is no room for perfection. There is no room to get better. There is no room to be diminished. No creature can diminish him. Oh my goodness. He's greater. And our most powerful level of power is still less than his level of weakness. Oh my goodness. We serve a God who is infinitely wise and powerful. That's why we must trust him. So it's on the cross where Jesus then fulfills this, this scripture. He became the foolishness of God on a tree. Jesus looked foolish on the cross. After performing all these miracles, saying all these wise words, it led him to dying on the cross looking like a fool. That's why they mocked him saying this is a fool. Look at the king of the Jews. He became the foolishness of God. But the foolishness of God is wiser than man. Sometimes in following Jesus, there are seasons where we begin to look like fools to the world. We shall look like fools. Why are you praying? Why are you in ministry? Why are you going to that church? Why are you giving to that church which is not your own church when you've got your own problems? It's foolish. But the foolishness of God is where God loves to go. Oh, goodness. Frustrate the wisdom of man. Oh my goodness. Why are you leaving that rich man who's abusing you? And to be single, it's foolish. Stay in that abusive relationship. I don't want the wisdom of man. I'd rather have the foolishness of God than the wisdom of man. When we look at the cross and how Jesus willingly looked like a fool for us, our response to the Lord must be, if you can look like a fool for me, so will I. If you chose to look like a fool for me, so will I. I will worship you and look like a fool. I will shout and look like a fool. I will say amen when the preacher is preaching and look like a fool. Because it's when we look foolish to the world that the power of God manifests. In our city of Johannesburg, where you're told, when you're told to live a holy life, you can look like a fool. It can sound foolish because our city is driven by greed, drunkenness, sexual promiscuity. So when you say, I'm not going to be materialistic, I'm not going to be a drunkard, I'm not going to be going in these Joburg streets sleeping around, it sounds foolish to everybody. It sounds foolish to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Let's stand. Jesus became a fool on the cross. But it was the wisdom of God. And God has a way of using means that seem foolish to man. To do great things in the earth. On the cross, Jesus not only became a fool. He became the weakness of God. But it's in the weakness 
that God proved to be stronger than man. It's that posture of weakness on the cross that the power of God was displayed. And it's in his weakness where God loves to display his power. And sometimes God puts you in seasons where it looks like you're weak. There's no way out. That is when God is present. That is when you need to trust him. When it looks foolish that one day I'm going to be a businessman and you are broke. Anointed and broke. Have you ever been anointed and broke? But you've still got hopes and dreams. And you sound very foolish to everybody. Oh my goodness. The foolishness of God is greater than the wisdom of any man. Trust God in those seasons. Those seasons where you look like you're being humiliated. Those seasons where you look foolish walking away from sin. You look foolish walking away from what God has not called you to do. Trust God. Trust God. Where are you when it comes to trusting God? As you're going through something difficult, look to the cross, look to the crucified one and trust him. He will come through for you. Ah, God is amazing. God is amazing. We have to learn to trust him. We have to learn to trust him. Don't be afraid to be humiliated for a season. Taking a job where you know I could do better. But you know, Lord, this is what you've provided. I might look like a fool right now. But you're working out something out of here. It's never too late with God. Oh my goodness. Never write off a child of God. One door, one opportunity. One door, one opportunity. He can change someone's life. Overnight. The one you were looking down on. You start looking up to. There's a season where they're going to look up to you. you you're in a foolish season. But the wisdom of God is going to humble those who are perishing. But those who are saved, when they see someone struggling, they don't say foolish things. They say, God is able. Yeah. Ah, we serve a God who is able. We saw Jesus becoming a fool. God is good at raising fools. God loves fools. He can bless fools. What did that song say? You can take the ordinary and make it the extraordinary. That's the God we serve. We trust Him in the low seasons, in the hard seasons. We don't lose hope. We don't, we don't stop praying. We pray even more. Some of you need to pray even more. You've worried enough. You've cried enough. It's time to pray like a mad person. It's time to pray like you've lost your mind. Are you hearing me here? It's time to pray like it's your last day. Amen. There's a scripture I want to share with somebody which the Lord used to encourage me this week. It's from Habakkuk 3, 17 to 18. It says, and this is a good one for married couples. It says, though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, he's saying, though everything in my life might not be working out, and there's no food, Yet will I rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the Lord of my salvation. Even in hard places. The fig tree has nothing. There's no fruit on the tree. The labor has failed. The fields have no food. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Ah, there's power in praising God when you've got nothing but praise. 
There's something about praising God when you've got nothing but praise in your mouth. I don't have anything this morning but praise. I don't have anything but worship. And I've come to encourage you that even if everything is not working out, yet you must praise Him. Yet you must rejoice. He is faithful that promised. He he uses fools to confound the wise. He uses the weak to confound the strong. The race is not for the strong, nor the race to the swift. But God is able to raise up nobodies and do great things. Father God, we thank you today for your omniscience. You see all things. Nothing is taking you by surprise that's happening in our lives. Nothing we're going through is taking you by surprise. Even the bad things we've been through, they are objectively bad. But we thank you, Father, that despite those bad things, something good is coming. Something good is coming your way. Something good is coming your way. Rejoice in the Lord every day. Something good is coming. Give God praise one more time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.